let's uh, let's get started. So how are you guys? How are you guys doing? I mean, ready for the midterms? Good. Um, so today I don't really have much to offer, but this is what we do anyway. Uh, so I will give you a quick re review of the materials covered in the midterm. This is not meant to be comprehensive; just to give you some pointers to where you look, where you should look at in the in the slides. And I'll give you some midterm teams, especially from the graders' points of view, because I and other TAs will be grading the exam, and I want to explain what do what do you expect expect in those uh, midterm questions. So. Um, so at first, at the beginning of this um, semester, Jeff talked about the uh, abstraction of the process, especially uh, what's inside an, a, a process. We have thread as the abstraction of the CPU, and we have um, address spaces, which is represented the memory, and finally we have files. So this entire semester is, is all about the various uh, abstractions inside the process. For example, for threads, um, because we have multiple threads running at the same time, so we have concurrency, we have synchronization, and we have rest conditions, and we have, have all kinds of synchronization pro um, problems. And for address space, uh, we have the virtual versus physical memory, and how to translate between them, and what data structure we use to help us do the translation, and what's the hardware uh, facilities are there available for to help us do the address space management. And for the file, uh, I, I believe you haven't talked about the file, uh, file system in the lectures, but um, before that, we already look at how um, we abstract, provide file abstractions in the system. In particular, um, we have three layers of abstraction of file systems, which is the, the file descriptor in the user space, the file handle per process private, and the file object, which is system-wide. And also, you want to um, go over the system calls, especially the file-related re system calls, to get you familiar with this kind of abstraction and how do we actually implement them in the real system, which is OS 161, of course. Um, so this process abstraction basically defines the whole theme of this semester. And that the Later uh, contents are, are mostly about this. So for, so for example, for synchronization, uh, we talk about critical section, uh, both in the lectures and the recitations. So what is the critical section, and uh, what kind of synchronization primitives we have to help us to coordinate the access to, uh, to the critical section. And for primitives, we have uh, lock, we have semaphore, we have CV and reader write locks, right? So you want to go over, quickly go over the code in the assignment one to get you familiar with these concepts. And also we talk about the synchronization pr uh, problems in assignment one, which is the coordination of the well mating problem, which is nothing uh, spe uh, particular, but nothing specific. But here the dialogue is really an important concept. You need to understand why dialogue happens. Right? We have four conditions to cause a dialog, which is basically we, each process need an exclusive access to the critical section. Right? We have uh, the dependency waiting. Right? What other two conditions to pr produce a dialog? So there are four conditions to cause a dialog. I, I mentioned two, which is the mutual access to the critical section and uh, uh, circular waiting. No preemption, right? There and there is a final one, which is uh, um, request for, for what? Resource. I can't remember actually, but there are four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you want you want to um, be very uh, familiar and be very clear with this concept, and also given these four conditions, how to avoid dialogues, right? So basically, in, um, by avoiding that, we mean if you break one or and just one of the four conditions, you uh, avoid dialog. For example, in the intersection problem, in assignment one, how do you uh, avoid the dialogs? So we have four quadrants and f as four shared resources. And so how do you guys solve the problem? 
which conditions you break. Circular dependency, right? So the way to break it is every car just grab the lock in a certain order. So there, is, there will, won't be two cars who grab a lock and want to grab another car's lock, right? That's one way to um, break the deadlock, right? There are other ways of doing it. Um, and so you may encounter such problems in the, in the exams. So this is for synchronization. And uh, we have uh, interruption handling. This is also related to the threads um, abstraction over the process. Because we have more threads than the CPUs, so we need to do context switch. We need to do scheduling. Right? To do that, we need to have some hardware uh, interruptions happen at per in a periodic way so that the kernel can take control and decide which process or which thread to run next. Right? So you need to, familiar, be, to be familiar with the process of the interruption handling, right? What happened when there is an interruption? And we also explain this a lot when I, in the recitations about assignment two, right? So for example, there I talk about the software interruption or software exception, where the user program used the syscall instruction to get kernel's attention, right? When user um, use an instruction called syscall, there is a soft software exception happens. So then what happened? So can you still remember what's the first thing the hardware would do? Go into privileged mode, right? Then what? What's that? Save the state? But before that, to do that, so the way to do this is kernel store the interruption handler in a specific, specific place, which is OX at media in the VIPS hardware, right? So every, whenever um, there is an interruption, the hardware first go into a provision mode, and then jump to that location, right? That location is agreed by the hardware and the kernel, right? And then in, in that small piece of code where there's all kinds of assembly code going on and saving all the context, then finally trap into kernel's um, interruption handler, right? And kernel first figure out what happened by looking at some registers containing the exception cores uh, why the exception happens, and then handle the exception, right? And then finally, when kernel handle the exception, the kernel return to user mode, but um, give some, some information back to the user and to uh, return the values, right? That's the syscall case. And you, you need to link this to all other uh, interruption uh, cases. For example, as another special case is where when there is an address exception. Basically, the user access a virtual address that doesn't have a translation in the TLB, right? That's another kind of exception you, you will see a lot in some, in some three, basically. So what happened there? And the process is similar, but the, the exception course is different, right? And also, because uh, the user program use the address at all the time, right? So you would expect far more um, address exceptions than the syscalls and others, right? Because we have far more uh, exceptions like that, the hardware may have some spe specific mechanism to deal with that interruption, to deal with, to try to optimize the performance, right? So the hardware may have deal with the TLB fault in a different way than normal exception. And you need to have some idea of what's the, what's, what's the difference there, how the hardware will accelerate the interruption um, handling process for TLB exceptions. And then we have a uh, context switch. Basically, uh, every, every now and then, the hardware have an interruption where the kernel take over and decide who, which process to run next, right? And because of this, we have scheduling problems. Basically, the which process to run as the next active process. Right? You have all kinds of scheduling algorithms, and you need to be um, know them and what, what's their um, advantages and what's the disadvantages of each scheduling algorithm. Okay. And uh, so next, we have the memory management. So here, the, uh, the most important concept is the virtual address. 
right? Why do we need a virtual address? What do we mean by uh, address is virtual instead of physical? What's the difference between that? And given a uh, virtual address, for example, user access virtual, virtual address OX4000, uh, what does it mean? How does the kernel find the actual physical address that associated with that virtual address, right? To do that, we both need hardware support, which is the TLV, also software support, which is the kernel data structures that maintain the mapping between the virtual and physical addresses, right? So we have page table, and we, have, we may have different uh, translation data structures. Page table is one if you use paging, right? By paging, we mean that we always use a fixed size allocation chunk, 4K bytes. Again, there are advantages and disadvantages of this, uh, of this mechanism, right? If you use the fixed size page, there will be no ex external fragmentation, but you may have internal fragmentation, right? Another way of doing this translation is instead of using a page table, you use a segment table where each segment can have a variable size, right? And again, that approach has its, um, its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, so you need to get familiar with uh, what's in there in the address space, right? We have code segment, which is the user program code, of course, and we have data segment, which is the static data that's declared in the user space. And we also have two dynamic regions, which is the stack and heap, right? So you need to know uh, what the stack looks like. I mean, I'm pretty sure you know what it looks like if you do exec v, right? where there, there you manipulate the user stack um, uh, quite heavily. So user stack always starting from the fixed top and grow downwards, right? And instead, users heap always start from other fixed location after users other segment and grow upwards, right? So you need to uh, kind of have a picture of where those segments are and how they are changing. And finally, we have TLB. Again, you need to understand why do we have a TLB, and um, so how does a TLB help the address translation process? So this is all the concepts you need to kind of be comfortable with um, when you prepare for the midterms. Um, if you don't get confused of any topics or any sentence I say here, you better go back and dig through the slides and figure out and study, study the concepts. So next, this is the format of the exam. It should be exam, not example. Um, I, I, I assume you already know it because you see all previous years exam papers, right? So we have basically 10 multiple choices and uh, we have in total, six short answer questions, and you need to choose four out of the six. And we have two long answer questions, and you are supposed to choose one of them. So the exam is 50 minutes, and we have 50 points. So you kind of know how many time to allocate for each type of the questions, right? If you, spend, if you find yourself spend far more time in the short answers, like you have only 10 or 15 minutes left for the, for the long answers, that's an, a better sign of a time management. So if you have 10 minutes for the 10 multiple choices, then you should spend at most 10 minutes, right? Uh, similarly, for the short answers, you should spend no more than 20 minutes or 25 minutes tops on the short answers. So here are some, some tips of, for the exams. So first of all, the most important tip is that you need to figure out what, the, what, do we, what do we expect to use for you to answer, right? So for each question, most of the questions uh, state very clearly what you, what you need to answer. For example, here, this is a um, short answer question I take from last year's midterm exam. Um, so you need to identify those sentences like, like they tell you what to do, right? So here, you need to name one of the um, abstractions, that's one point, and you need to describe that why it's useful, that's two points, and you need to pro, uh, explain how it's provided, provided. that's another two points. 
right? So when you do the exams, you need to kind of know what to expect, what we expect. Then you uh, go ahead and try to um, answer those questions. So that's a very first, in, uh, uh, very that's a very important important step to um, read the questions. I mean, read really read the question and then parse it. And another tip is that don't try to overflow the pages by putting everything you know in the in answers, right? For short questions, we ex expect no more than five sentences tops. So, to so you need you want before you write anything, you want to be um, kind of uh, organize your source and figure out what to answer and put the answer very concisely. If you force us to dig the answers by ourselves within paragraphs of paragraphs of text, then we'll probably not find the point and you will probably lose the point. And also uh, try, it's not required but recommended that you organize the answers in bullet point so it's to help us um, get to get I of get what you are saying were uh, more quicker so this is the final slide um, for the answer questions like I said you need to reserve at least 15 or 20 minutes into uh, for it and most of the answer questions as you may have already noticed that is not something you will hear from the lectures right it's kind of some new concept that recently come up from the last year's conference or even this year's conference. Um, so, but at the end of the day, if you look at what the question asks, you will find is something related to what we covered in the lectures, right? So for the long answer questions, don't, be, don't get panicked if you see a lot of new concepts and very funny stuff. So try to link what's the, ans uh, what's the question asks to what we, ha what we have learned in the class try to approach the questions that way, right? And also, the long answer questions, you already have some pointers to you or some hints to you to help you answer the question, right? Just like the, the example we see in previous slides, we also have some sentences like, first do this, then do that, and finally do this, right? These are the points we expect you to explain in your answers. And, uh, that's pretty much what I got from the review. And we still have time, so I will be very happy to, if you have any questions on the last year's exam questions or any other questions in general, I'll be happy, very happy to answer them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's the recommended way of doing it. Just split the questions, splitting the question into sub questions and trying to answer them separately. Yeah. You. Um, can you explain the difference between um, concurrency and autonomous? Concurrency. Yeah. Um, concurrency is speaking about the processes where multiple processes have the illusion of exacting at the same time while in, g in practice or in reality they are exacting sequentially but because of the context switch and because of the multiplexing stuff happening you get an illusion of that multiple things happen at the same time and autonomy is the property of some resources where um, even though multiple processes accessing the same resource um, they ha there has to be an order they cannot happen at the same time that's the autonomy for example, there are some instructions that cannot be interrupted, right? That's the atomic instruction where either it gets exactly at, uh, through or it doesn't get exactly at all. Yeah. Are there any exam questions you want to me to um, explain from last year's or the previous years? several instructions? A set of instructions. A set of instructions. That, that's a 
that's one way of saying it. Yeah, I think that's the acceptable way of saying it. We have uh, last year's, previous year's exam. And if you look at the solutions, you will also find the rubrics that we used when we grading. For Should we be looking at the final? Mm, not necessarily. I think, oh yeah, I look at the final. But the final does, finals also cover the um, materials before midterm. So our finals also can be cumulative? I can't remember exactly. I think last year, the final only covers materials after the midterm. So you're right. We're not. We shouldn't see the final. We should see the midterms. Yeah. Again, be prepared for the qu first question. <laughs> So if you look at the rubrics, you will find that um, you get a sense of what, are the, what, are, what we expect the answers to be, short and split. Um, no, any particular question you want me to explain? Practice one are pretty old. I think that's the first. That's the first years. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this question is about scheduling, and what's the advantages and disadvantages of. So, if you you will find a lot in that in system, not not in OS system, but in system in general, you have a lot of trade offs, like for for some threshold or for, for some. Um, system parameters. You have you always have pros and cons of choosing the um, the the parameters. For example, here, if the the if the oh, can you actually see it? So, for example, in round robin um, scheduling, if you choose the time scheduling quantum too long, what will happen? Uh, your system will be less responsive, right? Some background job may take too long to finish, and some foreground job may don't have opportunity to run. If, but if it's too short, I mean, you, for example, you schedule every one millisecond. That's quite, um, that's quite frequent. What's the what's the disadvantage of that? Context switch overhead. What's the advantage of that? You get a turnaround time. Um, each process get a little bit of more chances to run and uh, um, be able to um, adapt to the workload changes more agile. Right? And there will be such questions this every year. So address virtual address translation. So I would recommend you to go over the questions from last year and then the year before last year and really get comfortable of doing such translations. Are you guys allowed to take the calculators? Oh, yeah. So you need to do the calculation by hand. So anyway, um, each year there will be such questions. And this year there is no exception. So um, be prepared for such questions. and. Yeah, page tables. Um, swap. I want to see the long answer questions. Um, this is not typical long answer questions. Yeah, the second is a typical long answer question. You will see a block of text which you need to interpret and digest in a very short time frame and try to link 
the, on the questions to what you have learned. Basically, you need, first you need to figure out what this question is about. For example, here, priority inversion, this is about scheduling. Right? Then you, you need to digest the materials and, and then figure out what's expected. First do this, then do that, and organize your answers in such a way that it's easier for us to see what you are trying to get in, getting at. I guess this is pretty much it. Um, so good luck with the midterm. Thanks.